Uh, I don't know if you've been, if you're my Facebook friend, but I've been doing uh, some strange things with my life lately. As if I need to do things lately. And uh, tomorrow night, I'm going to be uh, uh, d doing a whole little show uh, over at the, the temple area, and, it's, and I'm going to do all my blasphemous songs, and, and uh, it's going to be very cool. But in case uh, you were going to miss that, I didn't want you to miss a little of it. So I thought I would just, uh, while you're settling in and warming up, I thought I would do a little blasphemous song because you might appreciate it. <clears throat> Maha Barata has got a hero divine. Lord of the universe. He's smiling all the time He's very handsome He's pretty Folks in the sticks And in the city Think it's a pity He can't make love to them all But he can Cause he's my idol, my hero I wouldn't be a zero if I were him There'd be no sin Will paint me blue And call me Krishna Ah, ah I wish I were Krishna Love God and the Hindu Java Krishna Love God of the Hindu I copy myself into multiple me's Make love to all the gopi girls I could please Delivering with each a limitable squeeze A full divine measure of unimaginable pleasure I wish I were Krishna Love God of the Hindu steadfast and true, vowing in truth, I love only you. Each monad of existence would be my sweet bride, whose womb I would penetrate and explode me inside. Oh, I, I wish I were Krishna, love God of the Hindu. Teach my loves of be steadfast and true, vowing in truth, I love only you, each monad of existence would be my sweet bride Whose womb I would penetrate and explode me inside Within you, without you, gush my ocean of Bindu I wish I were Krishna, love God of the Hindu.
Thank you. Steve and Judy. Hello, Steve and Judy. Oh. Well, uh, it's going to be downhill from there. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, I hope you come, come by tomorrow. Um, I've made a couple of CDs. I brought a few with me. Um, of course, I hope you buy them. I'm not asking you to listen to them. Okay. <laughs> But, but anyway, this is, uh, how many were here last night, too? Well, oh, it was so much fun. Um, the rites of Eleusis uh, have, have meant a lot to me in uh, just my life in general, magical life notwithstanding. So uh, I've been involved in their productions. Um, since before your mothers were born. <laughs> uh, a long time. I'll try, I'll try to get into it a little, a, a little bit. Um, but um, I've, I've, I've written about it in, in various things, and I've got a couple of introductions to the rites of Eleusis that I could, um, I could read off to you. But, um, and maybe I'll read a little something off the sheet. But, but basically, um, the the idea is anybody here have you just wandered in just kind of off the street it's rainy and cold you just stopped in to you don't know what this might be it might be a jehovah's witness thing or something <laughs> it's, it's a, uh, and okay okay welcome okay. well it's all about me okay <laughs> so, so start right there Magic is drama, and drama is magic. Magic is a, a dramatic spiritual art form. And since prehistoric times, magic has been done through the agency of drama. And we see dramatic effects written and drawn all over cave walls and etched into bones and strange extinct prehistoric animals. We've been doing this stuff for a long time. I was raised in Nebraska, speaking of prehistoric. <laughs> and if it hadn't have been for my local theater, I would have been a mass murderer. Twice a week, I would go. They'd change the movie every, every Saturday and every, and, or every Sunday, so I'd get to see two movies. Sometimes I'd see them three or four times. And I didn't care what the movie was. I'd see old strange black and white things and, uh, and comedies and B films, and I, I didn't care. It took me someplace else. It put me in contact, first of all, with my own imagination. But secondly, it put me in contact with the gods. And not just the, the, the mythological movies that actually had gods. Hi, I'm Zeus, you know. But the gods of archetypal agencies in the universe. I could see beautiful women. I could see handsome men. I could see handsome men with beautiful women. It ignited my libido. It charged my imagination. It was everything religion should be. It gave me inspiration. It gave me at least the hope of illumination. Drama is magic. And dramatic ritual has been institutionalized since prehistoric time. But there was one famous dramatic magical institution that dominated Greece 
for a couple of thousand years. That's a big, I mean, cats only ran how long? Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> and that's the rites of Aloysius, or Eleusis, or Alois. I don't know how you pronounce it any way you want. There is no correct pronunciation. You are free. And it started as an agricultural thing. Actually, it remained as an agricultural thing. Uh, does anybody here belong to the Grange or have parents or grandparents that were members of the Grange? Okay, they had dances down at the Grange Hall. You had pancake feeds down at the Grange Hall. You had, and on, on you, what you don't know is on Tuesday night, they had an all nude uh, pancake feed. No, they died. I've, well, maybe they did. Maybe I'm giving away something. They hold as their, their, their mythological um, uh, tradition the, the worship of the goddess Ceres or Demeter. And I've, I've, I've looked at the, the, the rituals the, the, of the Grange, and they are overtly pagan, okay? And it is so cool to think of people chewing tobacco and plucking chickens and being so pagany. It's like right out of one of those Lovecraft B movies where... <laughs> Everybody looks real normal, but you know, they got a octopus in the, you know. <laughs> well, this, the, the Grange is an attempt, uh, uh, mostly a 19th century attempt to kind of recreate what this, this rites of Eleusis thing was about. And uh, the, the idea, it, was to affect a change in consciousness in the members, okay? Uh, at first, there was a class of individuals that really were aware of the phenomena accompanying the obliquity of the Earth's axis and the causes of seasons and uh, the, the idea of uh, the the, the, the mysteries of agriculture, when things get planted, when, how long they, they stay, what kind of water they need, what, what months they need to, to stay under the earth, what, what, you know. But they needed an entire culture to cooperate with the organized uh, cultivation of all of this stuff. And all of those people didn't need to know all of the, the, the high-tech information. They just needed to have a calendar to tell them when to do this, okay? And, and some kind of a general reason to, to perform the, the, the duties that, uh, that they needed to do to sustain a full-blown organized agricultural state. And in Greece, there started to form a cult of Ceres or, or Demeter in the town of Eleusis. And the goddess Demeter was worshipped there. They eventually built a citadel. <laughs> Sounds so cool. They built a citadel on the plains of Eleusis, okay. And that's where Demeter was, was worshipped. And her daughter was also worshipped, um, Persephone. And there is a story that had been so popular for a couple thousand years before that about the goddess Isis coming from coming from um, Egypt, and Isis had her husband, Osiris, and they were a team, 
it was sort of like Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos. Okay. <laughs> Only immortal. <laughs> and according to tradition, they took Egypt out of uh, the Dark Ages. I mean, really Dark Ages, where people ate dirt and ate each other, okay, and didn't talk. Okay, I mean, who would you want to have a conversation with? Okay. And supposedly they taught them how to talk. They taught them how to, to, uh, to read and write. And they taught them how to stop eating dirt and planting things in it. Then they said, stop eating each other. It's bad for population. Okay. Isis and Osiris brought Egypt in just a couple of generations, according to the, the mythology, out of the Stone Age and into an organized culture. And the story goes, well, Osiris had a, had a brother who was uh, sort of a twin brother who was um, uh, jealous of his uh, um, popularity and um, Oh, when they had an election, uh, his brother set, uh, oh, he rigged the election in Florida and made sure that he got, uh, uh, there was, there's hard feelings all around, okay? And uh, uh, his, uh, his twin brother set, uh, while uh, Osiris and, and Isis were, were out uh, visiting another country, sort of on a campaign tour, uh, he secretly had Osiris's uh, measurements taken. I don't know how he did it. He had a, had a tailor or something with measuring tape and said, hey, look over there. <laughs> and um, but he secretly had his measurements taken. Then he had a box made that that was like a vacuum form uh, box that perfectly fit Osiris. And then when Osiris got back from his, his trip, he threw a big party for him and said, hey, look at this cool box that I made and I'll give it to anybody who can fit inside it. And people tried to fit inside it and it was too big for one person, too small for another. But Osiris, in, in what can only be described as divine folly, said, I'll try it. And, <laughs> And he gets in and it fits perfectly. And he goes, hey, this fits perfectly. But he couldn't even finish the word because they slammed the lid shut and nailed it, to, nailed it shut and, and uh, sent it off down the Nile. He was assassinated, dead. And the story goes on about how he was uh, magically brought back from life by his wife, Os uh, Isis. And she had to go through all sorts of all sorts of uh, adventures to do this, but mostly she went to another country, Byblos, where the coffin had stopped. And and in order for her to get that the, the coffin where it stopped in the river, plants grew up around it and a tree grew around it, and because he was a god, that the tree smelled really good. Okay. It was a long time ago, so I think it was like English leather, okay? <laughs> and it smelled so good that the king put it as a, as a pillar in, in his uh, uh, own palace. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to think about a god smelling really good in a big, long, pointy thing that it's strong and hard and could hold up a palace and it being a representative of a god. Or is it, or do I just have a dirty mind? <laughs> but anyway, Isis gets a job at the, at the palace. Okay, she forges her papers. She's got a green card or something. And she, she forges some papers and gets a job working for the, as a babysitter for the king. And she, she uh, uh, 
uh, starts to nurse the, the baby of the, of the king and queen. And uh, because she's a goddess, she doesn't even need to warm up a bottle. She just sticks her finger in their mouth and they go, mm, you know, and there's, there's all these little tiny stories. They're cute little vignettes of stories about how she tries to make the, the children immortal and stuff. But the, the, the gist of the story is she ends up getting her husband back and, and magically raising him from the dead. Not only that, but it really gets kind of sexy that uh, she's bringing him back on a barge and uh, she can't wait to, well, anyway, uh, he impregnates her from the dead. She becomes pregnant and has the famous twins, Horace. Okay. Now, that myth or variations on that myth was really, really um, uh, popular and it dominated Egyptian uh, society for a couple of thousand years. And not only that, but it helped with the timing of the festivals around this story. It helped the Egyptians know when to plant and when to do things. And those festivals were, were all uh, uh, based around the timing of the inundation of the Nile, where, where all of that fertile, um, fertile land coming up from the south uh, is deposited in that delta to area and stuff. So it's particular to, the, to Egypt. And everybody knew about Isis, and there, 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 was a, there was a mystery cult around Isis, and it was, it was uh, not so much a religion, but like a lodge, okay? a mystery school. And, uh, but it migrated up to Greece, and things had to change. It had to be tweaked for the weather and the, the conditions for, for Greece. They're no longer working with the inundation of the Nile and all of this. And so the Demeter and Persephone uh, uh, stories were just a, sort of a tweak of the Isis Osiris stories. Does that make sense? That's why there's everything is so... Uh, uh, so similar, but it really caught on. I mean, it really caught on. And it started to be a true institution of the worship of the earth as the goddess Demeter. And people started to come from all over to become initiates in the Eleusinian Mysteries, the Rites of Demeter. They enjoyed it, and it was secret. It was so secret that we really don't know for sure what went on exactly. I mean, nobody that went through it felt like talking about it. And supposedly, everybody who went through it never feared death again. We get little glimpses of it from Homer. And Homer was blind, so that means, I guess you don't have to see to make it work. But what happened was a, a long festival. There were two of them, the Greater Mysteries and the Lesser Mysteries. And you'd start in Athens with a big party, and you, and you bathed in the ocean, and then you ran up the road to, to Eleusis, and you partied, and you had a, had a good time, and, and you danced, and there was poetry, and there was, there was singing, and there were ceremonial meals. And we've just, in the last oh, 30 years or so, it's come to light that uh, there's a strange little thing that grows on the, the wheat that's grown on the Eleusinian uh, uh, plains there that, um, oh, what's it called? Ergot? 
can we say, oh, <laughs> but anyway, the idea of Persephone, the daughter of Demeter, picking flowers with her girlfriends. She sees a narcissus. She goes for it. Little does she know that Hades and his brother Zeus have made a deal where Zeus told Hades he can have Persephone as his bride. It was one of these arranged marriages. Okay. But they're gods, okay? And how many, that, there's a short pool of eligible bachelors, okay? So they, you know, they were chauvinistic, but who else are you going to do, you know? And, but nobody asked Demeter, and nobody asked Persephone. Sounds familiar. Anyway, the earth opens up. Here comes Hades, and he kidnaps, kidnaps uh, Persephone, takes her down to hell. Well, hell's not as bad as, as uh, you know, the Christian hell is. It's, it's dark. It's gloomy. Uh, but everybody ends up there. And uh, so it's not all that bad. They have, uh, you know, television plays, bingo, things like that. The... Demeter then goes on this search for her daughter. She eventually, with the help of Mercury or Hermes, uh, uh, gets her to come back to, the, to Olympus. But she's tricked into uh, eating some pomegranate seeds. I don't know where, who made this rule up. But I guess when you're getting ready to leave hell, don't stop for a snack. Okay. <laughs> but she did. And so she was forced to, to return to the underworld for a third part of the year, every year. Well, you can sort of see the, the, that she's the seed, and the seed goes under the ground for a while, and then it comes up, and, and, uh, and all of that. Eleusis was really, really popular. Everyone wanted to be an initiate of the Eleusinian mysteries. Nero wanted to be, okay, and he was emperor of Rome, and he put his application in, and they stayed. Damped it, rejected. <laughs> and he was heartbroken. But so powerful was, was the cult that they could get away with that. And it went right up until the third century of the Christian era before things like that were, were made illegal. And the mystery schools that we have uh, today uh, the Grange being being one of them, but the, probably the most famous is the Freemasons. Still have elements of the mystery school tradition uh, going for it. So that's the rite of Eleusis. But what it was meant to do for the initiate was that thing that they would not talk about, that thing that allowed them never, ever, ever to fear death again. It must have been pretty wild. And they have speculated, the, the writer, uh, Robert Graves, the man that uh, wrote uh, the I, Claudius, okay, and he also wrote this thing called The White Goddess, yeah, read that off of a couple cups of coffee. So. They fed them at the climax of the of the rites. They did everything together in groups, except for the last moment. And the last little vignette that they did, they did one on one. And you drank a consecrated uh, drink of, of uh, uh, like a mixture of mint and, and uh, probably some kind of 
You were dosed, okay? <laughs> they also use mushrooms. Oh, God, did they use mushrooms? And you were led in to a, a small little little room. Or actually, the rooms were, were just cloth uh, that was drawn between columns. Many, just a forest of columns. And you had it like a bag over your head and they led you in and you were frying. Okay. And they had singing and things going on and you've been maybe a week or longer dancing and singing and seeing vignettes and plays and things like that. You were, you were so ready. And you were probably going, whoa, the colors. Oh. And they take the, the veil over, off your head. And you're standing in front of a young woman like Persephone. And she has a single sheath of wheat in her hand, and that's the answer. You didn't even know what the question was until single, sh that's all it took. And the reaction was always, oh, fuck, whoa, wow, man, I get it. Okay. Now, if you haven't, I grew up in the 60s, and uh, <laughs> there was many times that, um, that after psychedelics and stuff, I'd go out to breakfast with friends, and somebody would hold up a cracker or something, and I'd go, oh, wow. I get it, man. This is the cracker of eternity, you know. <laughs> Whatever it was, it really worked. And it affected a permanent change in consciousness in the, the, the initiate. But you know, any good drama accomplishes the same thing. Shakespeare, you come away from a Shakespeare uh, play, a different person. You're elevated, you're illuminated, you're, you're hearing things that you never heard and seeing things that you've never, never seen. And on a real cold, chilly afternoon in uh, 1910, Alistair Crowley and his lover, uh, student, uh, uh, Layla Waddell, who is a violin virtuoso uh, from uh, New Zealand. She's the one that, with the long, the long uh, black hair, and you always see her kind of with her chest exposed, and she's got, she looks pretty damn hot, okay? <laughs> and um, when Crowley was with her, he was pretty much figured out he likes women. But, uh, and another one of Crowley's friends, Victor Newberg, the poet Victor Newberg, um, who, um, who could dance like crazy. And that's just not a turn of phrase. He could dance like crazy, okay? He could dance until he dropped completely exhausted. And uh, it, people are always telling him, stop now, you don't need to fall down, it'll be all right. But they were having dinner at a friend's house. Uh, Commander Marston was his name. And Commander Marston was uh, a British um, uh, sort of um, eccentric, uh, unlike any other British. <laughs> he, had this, um, he had this theory that the use of an African tom-tom uh, if you beat it just the right way, could cause a very proper uh, English uh, uh, English ladies to 
um, perform acts of self-abuse. That was his big theory. <laughs> and I think he enjoyed working on it. <laughs> but it was just the type of guy that Crowley liked to hang out and have dinner with. Okay? <laughs> And um, so to sing for their supper, uh, Crowley said, okay, as they're having cognac and cigars, and uh, Crowley said, oh, I'll treat you to a poem. And Crowley recites a poem. And everybody's all mellow, and they've got their cognac, and they go, wow, uh, that was groovy. That was really groovy. And Layla said, well, you feel groovy now. Listen to this. And she whips out her violin and she plays something that just blows everybody away, makes them cry. And everybody's a little bit higher than they were before. And Crowley's picking up on this. And then Victor said, hey, Layla, play something fast and I'll dance. And so she plays something fast and Victor leaps around the living room and until he's exhausted and he falls unconscious on the floor. And this is after more cognac and, and everybody goes, wow, I've never been this high in my life. And Crowley is figuring out this is the formula of the rites of Eleusis. This is the combination of art. This is the combination of drama. This is the combination of music that affects a change in consciousness. And so he went home and he wrote up this thing called the Rite of Artemis. And he produced it at the uh, office of the Equinox and advertised it as if it was a real live uh, dramatic thing. And the newspaper showed up and people showed up and they did it. And he made up a, a, a libation that everybody drank, nine libations of uh, during the ceremony, and it had mescaline in it. <laughs> And everyone had a good time, okay? <laughs> and the newspaper uh, reporter, after the, the colors, after the, his keyboard stopped melting, <laughs> wrote a nice uh, review of it, and Crowley was encouraged. And so he went to work to write seven planetary rituals that he called the Rites of Eleusis. Tonight you're going to see the Rite of Saul, okay? The, the, the rites were the right of, first one was the right of Saturn, second the right of, of Jupiter, third the right of Mars, and the fourth the right of Saul. Okay, then there was the right of Venus, the right of Mercury, and the right of Luna. And those Kabbalists among us uh, recognize the order of those ceremonies as the descending order of the planetary spheres on the Tree of Life. That is the descending scale. That is how the light of the divine, that is how the light of Godhead filters down, slows down, becomes more and more corrupted and slow until it finally manifests in matter. It's the mechanism. It's the seven part mechanism of creation itself. And the, the, the rites have nothing to do with Eleusis itself, but it has everything to do with what the rites of Eleusis were meant, to, were meant to do. And you are going to be treated tonight to something I think Crowley would have just absolutely loved. Okay. He produced them at Caxton Hall. As a matter of fact, he did it, did it twice. Caxton Hall does not hold even this many people. In uh, along about 1980, largely due to the efforts of the OTO, the rights of Eleusis started up again, starting with Lady Chandria up in the Berkeley area, who produced the rights. Uh, 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 and uh, she probably had all of all seven done in like a three month spread. In the following year, they did Saturn up up in Berkeley, and at my lodge in Costa Mesa, we uh, did the Rite of Jupiter. 
And after that, for the next foreseeable <laughs> decade or so, we did the Rites of Eleusis, the entire series, uh, uh, yearly, until we got so sick of it. <laughs> Not really. We grew old, and more and more people were wanting to do it. And the, and the, the sweet burden of the rites was lifted off of our shoulders. I remember one of the first uh, rites that wasn't actually produced in Costa Mesa that I was a part of. I played the, the part that John will be playing tonight, uh, Brother Leo, uh, in, uh, in the Berkeley uh, performance of it. Uh, and they mounted the thing in uh, a venue that was a combination junkyard and mental institution. <laughs> It was perfect, just, just perfect. So I, I want you to enjoy this. I'm going to read one thing that Crowley said about it, uh, about the rites, because what, what you're seeing tonight is just one act of seven, of a seven act play. And uh, starting with Saturn, man unable to solve the riddle of existence takes counsel of Saturn, extreme old age. Such answer as he can get is one word, despair. Now, these rites aren't a celebration of the God in its exaltation. It's a, it's a celebration of the God as it's falling. We're coming down the tree of life. We'll see the sun in this one, but each of the rites shows the descent, the fall of the planetary sphere that we're working with. Is there more hope in the dignity and the wisdom of Jupiter? No. Oh, Crowley's such an optimist. For the noble senior lacks the vigor of Mars, the warrior. Counsel is in vain without the determination to carry it out. Mars, invoked, is indeed capable of victory, but he has already lost the controlled wisdom of age. In the moment of conquest, he wastes the fruits of it in the arms of luxury. It is through this weakness that the perfected man, the sun, is of dual nature. His evil twin slays him in his glory. So the triumphant Lord of Heaven, the beloved of Apollo and of the Muses, is brought down into the dust. And who shall mourn him but his mother, nature, Venus, the lady of love and sorrow? Well is it if she bears within her the secret of resurrection. Next is Mercury. But Mercury too is found wanting. Not in him alone is the secret cure for all the woe of the human race. Swift as ever he passes and gives place to the youngest of the gods, to the virginal moon. Behold her, Madonna-like, throned and crowned, veiled, silent, awaiting the promise of the future. She is Isis, and Mary, and Ishtar, and Bhavani, Artemis, and Diana. But Artemis is still barren of hope, until the spirit of the infinite all, the great Pan, tears asunder the veil and displays the hope of humanity, the crowned child of the future. All of this is symbolized in the holy rites, which we have recovered from the darkness of history. And now in the fullness of time, disclose that the world may be redeemed. Thank you guys very much.
15 minute intermission, at which point the show will start.